Innovation Center for bringing Jason and Dr. Sorens here to, to work with us. Uh, they are a great partner of ours out of Washington doing excellent work. If you've not checked out uh, that center before, please Google them and check out one of the, the, the work they do. They do a variety of uh, excellent work uh, on all the issues you can imagine that you should check out. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors, Ohio Rising uh, and Bottom Line CPA, Bill Jacob, a lot of your friends. With that, let me introduce Dr. Sorens. Uh, Dr. Sorens is an affiliated scholar uh, at George Mason University where he works with the center. His latest work, which is what we're here to talk about, is Freedom in the 50 States, which has now become a yearly publication. Uh, and this one is coming out in about the official, in about a month? March 28th. March 28th, so two weeks. So we get a sneak peek of, of, of that report and, and what Dr. Sorens is going to talk about and uh, what's going on in Ohio where we wrap and stack from year to year. So I'm very, very excited to have him here uh, in uh, Rapid Fest. So thank you for coming. We've taken this uh, show on the road to many different places from Arizona to Pennsylvania. It's good to be here in Ohio. Uh, talking about what freedom in the 50 states means for the Buckeye State. Uh, freedom in the 50 states is a publication that we started in uh, 2008. It was really when we started working on this. And the idea was we wanted to measure freedom, individual liberty, across the 50 states looking at uh, both economic issues like taxation, spending, government regulation of business, and personal freedoms, uh, social issues, um, uh, lifestyle issues. And our view is that uh, limited government works best. We want um, a government that protects people's rights rather than um, providing for them or telling them what to do with their private lives. And so we wanted to see how states stack up there. And a lot of people underestimate how important states are in the American federal system. Uh, the federal government does a lot, there's no doubt about it, and that's the focus of a lot of political attention. But states are very, very important political actors. They're very important actors in our lives. Uh, state and local governments make up over 40% of all taxation in the U.S. So federal government is a little under 60%, state and local governments over 40%. And that gives you a basic idea about the division of policy responsibilities between the federal government and state and local government. State and local governments are almost half of government in the United States, and yet they receive a lot less attention uh, than the federal government does. When people talk about politics, they're always talking about the federal government. When we did this study for the first time, uh, we started collecting some data on these states um, and came out with the first edition of this index in February 2009. That was when the first edition was released. And, uh, and it got a surprising amount of media attention from that. And uh, we've done lots of radio shows, and uh, my co-author, William Ruger, has uh, been on, uh, been on uh, Fox and Friends in the morning. Um, so it got a lot of attention. People like indices. They like it when you rank the states in various ways. So it ended up um, getting a lot of attention. But we're academics. What we wanted to do was really come up with a valid uh, measure of public policy and see whether that mattered to people, whether it made a difference to people, whether their state was relatively free or not. So people have a lot of questions. Uh, as we enter our third edition, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, the methodological improvements we've made, just a little bit about how we've improved the index since the first edition, and give you a sneak peek at some of the results in this edition. Okay, so some questions that you might ask, that you might have about uh, measuring freedom. How can you measure freedom? Where are we measuring? We're looking at state and local policies in all 50 states. We're not looking at the District of Columbia, uh, which uh, it's a little different from the states because Congress can legislate for D.C. And in this third edition, we now have data for 2001, 2007, 2009, and 2011. So we've updated the data, uh, and we've taken it back to 2001. So we now are able to look at the evolution of freedom over an entire decade. Because of lags in um, the fiscal measures that we get from the Census Bureau, 
Uh, we do not include data from the legislature elected in 2010. Right? The, the legislature elected in November 2010 took office in 2011. Uh, we don't have data from, from the policies enacted by that legislature. Uh, the closing date for our study is December 31, 2010. So any policy enacted, that is, passed by the legislature and signed by the governor or passed over his veto, um, by the end of 2010 is included in our index with the idea that this will capture basically the state of freedom early in, in 2011. What are we looking at? We have three dimensions of freedom. Fiscal policy, regulatory policy, and personal freedom. Fiscal policy refers to taxation, government spending, government employment, those sorts of broad indicators of government uh, fiscal activity, taxation and spending. Regulatory policy has to do with regulations on business, and personal freedom has to do with as more personal lifestyle or social issues. Individual policies are weighted by the actual value of the freedom concerned to those who enjoy it in dollar terms. So what does this mean? Well, whenever you create an index of freedom or an index of anything, you have to figure out a way of getting all the individual components added up. How do you do that? Uh, there are other indices of freedom that have been out there, indices of economic freedom. What makes our index unique is including the, the personal freedom side. Uh, but they never really come to grips with this way of aggregating. You could just say everything's worth the same. So for instance, whether a state has reformed eminent domain, uh, which uh, is the process by which government can take land for public use. In some states, government can take land for private use. In my state, New York, they do that all the time. They'll just take your home and give it to a developer. They'll give it to a university, you know, a basketball team, which is something that happened recently. They'll just give it to anybody. Um, so that's a measure of freedom that we take into account, right? Your property rights are not secure when a state like New York can take your home and give it to Bruce Ratner, the owner of the New Jersey Nets. Um, so we include that. Um, but what about, we include some other things too, like uh, that, are, that are maybe much smaller in significance. Something like whether the government mandates that uh, private universities permit all kinds of political speech. Well, that's a restriction on freedom. Right? Private universities should not be forced to allow, uh, you know, it's, let's say communists or Nazis or, or whoever um, to, to make political speech. Maybe uh, allowing political speech is a good idea, but they're private universities, it's private property, you should be able to. Um, but this is a small issue compared to something like eminent domain or compared to taxation. So um, it just doesn't make sense to, uh, to weight them equally. And instead what we do is we actually calculate using um, data that we find in the published academic literature in economics and public policy. We actually calculate the value of each freedom and put a dollar figure on that. Um, so we figure out how much better off are people when they enjoy this freedom. And, and that's how we aggregate these policies into an overall index of freedom. Why would we measure freedom? Uh, freedom is valuable for its own sake, but it also may have dynamic benefits. We think freedom is justified because it's good for people to be free. It's good to allow people to be free. But freedom might also be related to issues like economic growth or in-migration. And so we want to see whether freedom might also have instrumental value, whether it's good for improving the economy. We intend this index for citizens, legislators, journalists, policy analysts, and scholars. Citizens can use the index to figure out how their states are doing well, whether, whether their states are doing badly hold their legislators accountable. They could even use it to figure out where they want to live. Legislators can use the index to figure out, again, where the state is doing badly, how it can improve, especially um, if they're interested in improving the state economy, what policies would help do that. Journalists can use it to figure out what uh, the state has been doing, how it compares to other states. Um, is the state moving in a certain direction or not? Policy analysts can figure out, can use our data uh, to figure out the consequences of different policies for things like growth in migration and other 
uh, variables of interest, and scholars can do the same thing and, and uh, can also figure out try to figure out what uh, what are the origins of freedom. Uh, what um, what sorts of ideology, ideological views in the electorate might help create an environment favorable to freedom? Uh, what sorts of political institutions might help create an environment favorable to freedom? How do we define freedom? Uh, we define freedom as the enjoyment of basic rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as the Declaration of Independence puts it. Again, we think that uh, government should be there to protect those rights, and we believe that government has that role but it should not deprive us of those rights. We look only at governmental infringements of freedom. Obviously, private criminals can take away your freedom, too. Right? And that's important, and, and there are statistics on that. You can look at uh, violent and property crime rates and get statistics on that. So what we want to measure is governmental infringements of freedom, but we ignore certain controversial issues like abortion or the death penalty, where people may legitimately have different views about which position protects freedom and which position violates freedom. So we just exclude those from the index altogether. We want to look at issues where you can make a clear case that government is somehow limiting your rights to life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness. Fiscal policy has to do with taxation and government spending. And here's um, how it breaks out. Tax burden ends up being 28.6% of in the index, government employment about 3%, government spending about 2%, government debt about 1%. Fiscal decentralization, which is how internally decentralized the state is, whether uh, localities have more power um, to adjust taxation, is worth about 1%. And I put up here how Ohio scores relative to its neighboring states. So of the neighboring states, Kentucky does best nationally, it comes in 20th nationally, Ohio comes in 35th, um, just ahead of Indiana and Michigan. Regulatory policy, I'll talk a little bit in uh, slightly more depth about uh, this category. The most important uh, component of our regulatory policy dimension is something here called liability system. What we're talking about there is how friendly the state court system is to plaintiffs. So if you sue someone, um, is it easy to get a multi-million dollar judgment? Is it easy to, uh, to hit the lottery jackpot against businesses and other uh, defendants in these um, civil torts? And this is a, a major problem, a, a much bigger problem than even we realized when we did this edition of the index. And, and this, uh, We've always had this in the index, but it's worth more in this edition because we did the research and we found that the tort tax is a really big part of business costs. Business costs get passed on to consumers. Um, and so we look at how states score in uh, a survey of business owners and managers on the quality of their tort system, uh, specifically related to torts. And that ends up being worth 11.5% of the whole index and is the most important regulatory uh, variable. Real property rights. There we're talking about rights in land. Does the government respect the rights of landowners? So eminent domain gets in there. Right? If the government is taking away your home or your business and giving it to um, private developers, that's an infringement of your property rights. And we include that in there. We also include things like rent control. New York City has rent control on about a third of apartments in Manhattan. And what that means is uh, you're not allowed to charge above a certain rent. So there are people still uh, paying you know, $400 a month for apartments in Manhattan. <laughs> and obviously this is a, an enormous deprivation of the property rights of the owner of those apartments, right? They cannot get the fair market value uh, for what they own. And there are lots of costs to that, social costs to that, including uh, the fact that landlords have no incentive to improve their properties. I'll just try to let them deteriorate to the extent that they can, uh, or even abandon them. Um, the fact that 
there's extreme inequality in how much people pay for these apartments. So apartments that are not rent controlled, you might be paying $2,000 a month for the same apartment, you know, five times more. What's the difference? I mean, someone's managed to get, get a rent controlled apartment, maybe through connections, political connections or something, and they pay a lot less, and that seems unjust. Um, economists have estimated that the costs of rent control to Manhattan per year are $300 million. So this is a, you know, it's a, it's a big cost to their economy. Uh, so we include that. We also include um, local zoning laws and, uh, and how, uh, how much development is controlled. So in some states, local zoning laws can be very strict. California is a classic example. And uh, that tends to drive up house prices through the roof. Um, Ohio actually does rather well on that. Local zoning laws are fairly flexible and allow development, um, which allows a town like Dublin to, to grow uh, quickly. Health insurance. Health insurance has to do with um, policies like community rating and guaranteed issue. What's that? Well, community rating says that you charge, you're forced to charge healthy and unhealthy people the same premium if you're a health insurer. And the, the point of that is to reduce premiums, especially for people who are older or people who have pre-existing conditions. The problem with that is that insurers then no longer want to accept people who have pre-existing conditions or people who are older, people who are unhealthy for whatever reason. They, they're going to try only to accept people who are young and healthy because they're not allowed to charge a higher price for people who are unhealthy. So then some states decided to adopt guaranteed issue and said, no, we're going to force you <laughs> to sell policies to all comers. And then insurers said, OK, well, we're just going to get out of that business altogether. Um, and that's what happened uh, in states like uh, Massachusetts, where it was very, very difficult to get uh, to find an insurer who would give you um, a policy on the non-group market where you had community rating guaranteed issue. And if you could get one, it was extremely expensive because they would just assume that you were you know, on your last legs and, and buying insurance because um, you, know, you, you were going to have massive medical expenses. And so they would charge an, an immense amount. So what Massachusetts did um, when uh, Mitt Romney was governor uh, was to adopt this policy of the individual mandate. And now the, uh, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, includes uh, an individual mandate to buy health insurance along with community rating and guaranteed issue. So as of uh, January 1st of next year, those policies will be enforced nationwide. So health insurance is an issue that it makes up 5% of our index. It's an area where states have been experimented. Lots of states do not have community rating and guaranteed issue. Lots of states have experimented with um, market mechanisms to reduce uh, health insurance costs, um, including reducing mandates, allowing people to buy bare bones policies, high deductible policies. All of those things are now abolished. As of uh, 2014, um, this whole area is being federalized. So, next edition of the index, uh, actually, next, the next edition will, uh, will be 2013, so we will still have it. But, um, but after that, it's going out of the index because this is no longer an area where there's meaningful um, variation among the states. Labor market, here we include regulations on, uh, on employers, um, including things like um, workers' compensation regulations, uh, right to work laws, uh, which are beneficial for business, uh, minimum wage laws, and the like. <coughs> Occupational freedom, here we include uh, the stringency of licensing requirements. If you want to practice an occupation or profession, if you want to be a barber, if you want to be a massage therapist, a <coughs> landscape architect, even in Louisiana, a florist, uh, you have to get an occupational license, and some states make those requirements very onerous to make sure that only a small, uh, small number of people are able to practice and they can charge high prices. It's a way of keeping out competition. Uh, some states, uh, forbid nurse practitioners from practicing independently from, uh, from medical doctors or from uh, prescribing prescription medications. We also include that. Um, states that do allow nurse practitioners to practice tend to have lower health care costs for primary care. 
Uh, miscellaneous regulations here include other types of regulations on, say, automobile insurance, uh, property insurance, uh, certificate of need laws for opening hospitals. Some states uh, still prohibit you from opening a hospital without getting the approval of existing hospitals. <laughs> existing hospitals don't like that. <laughs> they like the uh, cable and telecom, here we include uh, deregulation of telecommunications and cable markets. Uh, Indiana is an example of a state that has comprehensively allowed statewide competition uh, between cable and telecom providers in all areas of the, uh, the video and telephony markets. And here on regulatory policy, we see Ohio does uh, reasonably well, 21. Uh, Indiana is number one in the country. Uh, West Virginia, by contrast, is near the bottom at number 29. Personal freedom. Uh, I'll go more, a little more quickly through these. Uh, victimless crimes is, is about 10% of the index, which includes uh, incarceration rates that are higher than expected given, um, given your crime rate, uh, as well as arrest for things that, uh, that uh, we don't believe uh, ought to be uh, crimes because they don't have a victim. We include gun laws, um, the stringency of gun laws. We include uh, cigarette taxes and smoking bans and the tobacco there. We include alcohol regulation, state control of distribution, taxation of alcohol, blue laws. Um, we include uh, marriage laws and partnership laws. Uh, we include uh, marijuana laws, gambling laws, education such as regulations of private and schools, schools, uh, various malaprohibited or called civil liberties, and just random uh, personal freedom issues like whether sale of raw milk is allowed and things like that. Uh, travel, uh, seatbelt laws and, and things like that, whether you're required to get insurance that covers underinsured drivers. Uh, asset forfeiture is a tiny percentage of the index. You might wonder about that. So what is asset forfeiture? Asset forfeiture um, is the process by which um, police can actually bring a um, suit against your property uh, and say that your property was either used in a crime or was proceeds of a crime. They don't have to prove that the owner was actually guilty of a crime. If the property was used in a crime, they can take the property. Uh, so there's a recent case, the, actually the owner uh, won this case in Massachusetts where the uh, U.S. Department of Justice brought, uh, brought suit against a motel. Uh, and literally the, you know, the case number is something like the, the name of the case is the Department of Justice versus 128 Lawrence Street. And they literally bring suit against, suit against the property. And um, the owners of the motel hadn't, hadn't engaged in any criminal activity. There was no allegation that they engaged in criminal activity or necessarily that they even knew about it, um, but um, because it had happened on their property, the, the, the property could be taken. Um, however, the owners actually did win that. that seems, now, states differ very much in, in the procedures here, and that might seem like a very important issue for freedom. Um, if they could, if the government could take away your property uh, and place a burden of proof on you, that seems to undermine <coughs> centuries of uh, English and American uh, jurisprudence. Um, and indeed it does, but here's the problem. States have often enacted reforms to try to prevent this kind of abuse of asset forfeiture. But what happens is that the Department of Justice then will take those cases. So, when, so local police departments will say, oh, we can't forfeit the property because state laws are strict. DOJ, why don't you come in, forfeit the property, and give us some of the proceeds. That's what they do. So state law in this area is right now a dead letter. Um, pretty much. It's just purely symbolic until the Department of Justice can be controlled or states, states can enact legislation doing this, prohibiting uh, local police departments from taking forfeiture funds from the Department of Justice, at least under certain conditions, and that would help, uh, help on this issue. Then finally, campaign finance contributions. Limitations on campaign contributions are end up being a tiny percentage of the index because actually People don't spend a lot of money on campaign contributions, despite what you hear um, in the news. This is a sort of minor thing. Um, on personal freedom, Ohio ends up number 34. Uh, Indiana and West Virginia do well at number 7 and 9. Uh, Michigan does uh, somewhat worse at 41. 
So we want to look at the consequences of freedom. We think freedom is valuable for its own sake, but is it valuable for other things too? Do Americans value freedom? One question. We weren't sure going into this what we would find. We didn't really expect to find um, necessarily that Americans would value freedom. They don't always vote that way. Um, but they vote with their feet for freedom. They don't vote in the ballot ball box for freedom, but they vote with their feet for freedom. Uh, fiscal freedom, regulatory freedom, and personal freedom are all individually and together statistically correlated with net in migration. In other words, people move from less free states to more free states. We find this when we, no matter how we, we do this, we, um, we try to control for climate, cost of living, income growth, other attractive features of states, we keep finding these results. People are attracted to freedom. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be anything else. It seems to be the freedom that, uh, that, is, that is mattering here. Um, cost of living makes a difference too, but um, cost of living in turn is probably affected by some of the policies we look at. Um, land use regulations, for instance, are, are particularly uh, closely correlated with cost of living. Uh, states with tougher land use regulations tend to have much higher cost of living. What about uh, economic growth? Does economic freedom in particular encourage economic growth? And we find yes. Um, regulatory and fiscal policy are positively associated with state cost of living adjusted personal income growth. In other words, adjusting for changes in state cost of living, which often were significant over the 2000s, states like California becoming very, very expensive places to live. Um, when we adjust for that, we find um, that states that grew faster uh, tended to have um, better regulatory and fiscal policy um, at the start. And we think this is not, this is not um, states that grow fast adopting, then tending to adopt good policies because we look at um, regulatory and fiscal policy at the start of the decade. So if you were a, a freer state in terms of economic freedom in 2001, you had more growth over the next several years. And regulatory uh, policy is about twice as important for growth as fiscal policy. What I want to show you here is how Ohio stacks up on these, uh, on these metrics. So on the left-hand side, we've got a set of bars indicating the net migration rate. That's the, the number of people who moved into the state from other states from 2000 to 2010, minus the number of people who moved out of the state to other states from 2000 to 2010, divided by 2000 population. So, what we see here is that uh, Michigan has had a lot of net out migration. That means about 5.5% of Michigan's 2,000 population on net moved out to another state over the next 10 years. Uh, part of that is due to the economic troubles in Michigan, as you can see. Uh, Michigan has also had about lost almost 2% per year in, uh, in personal income uh, from that's just from 2000 to 2007. That doesn't even include the, the recession. So Michigan's had a significant economic problems. That's not news. Um, but Ohio has also had trouble, especially with people moving out. Uh, it's lost over 3% of its 2,000 population on net to other states. In terms of personal income growth as well, uh, Ohio has had a very anemic, about half a percentage point per year growth. And normally, we would expect in an advanced country economic growth to be at least 2% per year. So Ohio is not doing as well as the rest of the country uh, economically, and it's, it's losing people to other states. However, um, Kentucky and West Virginia are attracting people. Part of that's due to cost of living. Uh, part of it is probably also due to, uh, to perhaps personal freedom, because most states do well on that. And Indiana is more or less treading water. Um, Indiana hasn't lost anybody. Its net migration rate has been you know, less, about a third of a percentage point negative. And its income growth has been about 1% per year. Um, so really, the states that are comparable here are states like Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania. These are all so-called Rust Belt states, right, that have large manufacturing base, at least uh, traditionally. Um, industrialized early. Kentucky and West Virginia are a bit different than more rural. Right? 
But if we look just at the Rust Belt, so-called Rust Belt states, it's definitely Indiana that's doing the best. And Indiana is definitely, of those states, the, the freest as well, um, especially on, on regulatory policy. There's a sneak peek at Ohio's profile. So Ohio was 33rd in 2001 overall, and it's 33rd in 2011. We don't see a tremendous amount of change over the decade. Um, we see some improvement on regulatory policy and some decline on personal freedoms, including a, a, a pretty strict smoking ban uh, that was enacted. Taxation in the Buckeye State is higher than average, you're saying. Uh, the plus side, government debt and spending are below average. However, public safety, administration, social service, and government employee retirement benefit spending are high compared to the rest of the country as a percentage of personal income. And Ohio tends to be fiscally centralized, meaning that uh, local governments, probably especially schools, tend to be dependent on state money. Ohio performs better in the regulatory realm. The state's liability system is about average. It's fairly well on land use freedom, something I mentioned. Um, Ohio, like a few other states, does not allow private workers' compensation insurers. That's something we would recommend changing. Unlike North Dakota and Wyoming, though, Ohio does allow employer self-insurance for workers' comp. The state's occupational licensing regime and level of health insurance coverage mandates are decent, a little better than average. And Ohio is not a right-to-work state, which uh, we would recommend changing. Telecom and cable have been deregulated, although not as thoroughly as Indiana, I might add. Here's some of our policy recommendations. I'm just showing you the fiscal and regulatory policy recommendations. Our fiscal recommendation is generally to reduce taxes slightly, more or less across the board, and reduce spending on those areas that I mentioned where the state spends more than the national average. On regulatory policy, I would say uh, look to Indiana. Look at what they've done to become first in the nation and enjoy higher rates of economic growth. Uh, we would recommend considering changing the workers' comp system, rolling back occupational licensing, and adopting a right to work law as Indiana has done and uh, Michigan has done. Uh, those are re very recent changes that don't show up in our index, but um, you know, the, the potential for competition there is obvious. If Ohio does nothing, a lot of employers are going to start locating to Indiana and Michigan instead of Ohio. Uh, taking a look at some contemporary issues in Ohio, uh, the proposed tax reform that's on the table that would uh, take advantage of new uh, natural gas revenues, um, severance taxes, and, um, and cut uh, income and I believe sales taxes as well. Is that the uh, something to cut income and sales taxes? Uh, that could substantially improve Ohio and freedom index. Um, we, we exclude severance tax revenues from our measure of tax burden. And there's a good reason for that. Um, and the reason is, and this, I know this has been a hot debate in Ohio, but um, the evidence is overwhelming that the people who effectively pay the severance taxes are people who live outside the state. Right? Alaska runs almost its entire state government on severance tax revenues because it's a small state in terms of population and has huge oil and gas reserves. Uh, and it's able to maintain a very low effective tax rate uh, for people who live there. So Ohio, by switching more to severance taxes and cutting income and sales taxes, definitely could provide, in our opinion, a much more favorable environment for taxpayers. However, Medicaid expansion could, in the long run, uh, depress Ohio's fiscal policy score. Uh, and it's too early to tell exactly how that might happen. Um, it could be that the federal government, or there are lots of uncertainties associated with this. Opponents of Medicaid expansion will say that the federal government um, is committed to paying a lot right now, but what happens 10 years from now when the federal debt is an even bigger problem? They might cut back their contributions to Medicaid, and then you have lots of people on your rolls, and how are you going to pay for them? That's, a, you know, I think a legitimate concern. Um, but, um, but we just don't know exactly how Medicaid expansion will play out. There are a lot of political uncertainties here. 
uh, it won't directly de depress Ohio's score in our index because we don't include uh, Medicaid spending as a, a negative for the state. If it doesn't result in increased taxes and it doesn't result in increased government employees, then it's not going to decrease Ohio's score. But again, we can worry about the long run. If it eventually does cause higher taxes for Ohio residents, that would be a problem. If it attracts residents who want to get those Medicaid benefits, and then that could be a problem because then those residents might be more politically likely to vote for higher taxes um, because they're, you know, they see a, a personal benefit from that. So um, this is an area of risk for Ohio. Right to work. If Ohio had adopted a right to work law, it would have gone up to uh, number 17 in our regulatory policy index, just ahead of Oklahoma and not far from North Carolina. States that have been doing very well in terms of attracting business. Um, so a, a fairly substantial improvement from that potential reform alone. And that's uh, all I have for you. I would like to uh, take some questions now. In the time that I've lived in Ohio, some 30 years, uh, Ohio seems to relish in being average. The politicians, <laughs> the politicians will tell us incessantly that being average is okay, we're improving. But we're okay. We're not at the bottom. Can you comment on that? Well, it, it is remarkable how sort of in between Ohio is on our index. It's always sort of in the middle, not, not, not very high, not very low. But the problem is that um, the, way, the nature of the economy um, these days, average isn't, isn't going to be good enough for Ohio because of the fact that um, people do tend to move from northern states to the Sun Belt um, because of the fact that um, our economy has moved significantly from manufacturing to services, and that's where a lot of the growth in the economy is. Those are issues that um, present peril for Ohio, and as we've seen, people, many more people are leaving Ohio than are coming to Ohio. And so Ohio really has to be better than the Sun Belt states, than a lot of them. If it's going to keep people, if it's going to keep businesses. Um, so you, you have to compensate for the, the disadvantages now that the, the state has. And the fact that it, people don't like the winters, I guess, and they're moving to places like Arizona, Nevada, and Florida, and Texas. Well, how are you going to counteract that? You have to have better policies in those Your study, can you comment on the effects of net migration, uh, negative net migration? I would think it's a terribly destructive thing to a state if, uh, you know, they're going to have vacant homes and vacant office buildings. And it is, and I, I live in western New York, so I have a lot of experience with a region that has experienced substantial net out migration. And net out migration has been so significant in my county, Erie County, that um, that the county has lost population, 10% of its population in the last decade. So um, what you end up with is a, a great population as younger people leave for, first for college and then for work, and they'll find work somewhere else. Um, you tend to have falling house prices because there's not the demand for housing that there used to be. Um, you tend to have greater fiscal burdens as a result of the fact that um, the workforce is diminishing as a percentage of the population that's left behind. So it, it, it has the potential of becoming a bad equilibrium. And I think we've seen that very much in New York, which is the worst state on our index, and has, ex has lost on net about 10% of its population since 2002 other states. Uh, people are leaving New York in droves. And it's, um, it has the potential to lock in New York as a, a high tax, um, falling property values, um, you know, a place where, where people don't want to work anymore. Did any, did any of your studies include in the personal freedom category ballot access? Mm -hmm. Actually, we do not include that in uh, personal freedom, um, and uh, that's something we could consider. Are you thinking uh, for, for third parties and independent candidates? You know, that's something to, to consider. In the Obamacare area, particularly as, as it relates to the health care uh, uh, exchanges that are asked to be set up by the states, of which the state of Ohio said it wouldn't do. 
there will be costs associated with that that might ultimately be forced back to the state one way or the other, higher or lower. I think it's an unknown right now, uh, as well as some of the other issues on Medicaid. Do you really think you have enough information to make that determination? Um, well, we'll have to uh, see how the policy process in Washington, D.C. works out. Um, from uh, our research on this topic, the state exchanges will not have any appreciable freedom to maneuver. And they're basically going to be controlled uh, by Health and Human Services at the federal level. And the, DV, the, the changes among the states, the differences among the states, won't be significant enough to show up in our index. Now, if the costs get pushed back onto the states, uh, that would show up in our taxation variable, for instance. Um, or if state workers are implementing this, this would show up in government employment, government consumption. So those things would show up in our index. Um, HHS has made noises about allowing states to, um, to determine what the minimum level of benefits that must be uh, included in policies on the exchanges would be. If so, that would be something we would still include. But still the vast, if, if the law stays as it is written uh, for the next couple of years, then, um, then the vast majority of this category is there's not going to be any appreciable difference across the states. Are you possibly able to add some type of way of measuring social welfare to this, to this report? And I, I, I like this report. It's, it's a novel way of looking at things. Uh, it, it strikes me that there is, there would be an objective way of measuring social welfare. So you get to a point at which you could actually say something like, such and such a state max, uh, adds the most social welfare per dollar spent, or this such and such a state adds the most social welfare per state employee. So that eventually you get to a point where, where you would say, this state maximizes both freedom and the amount of social welfare per ta tax dollar. Yeah, so um, cost-benefit analyses try to do this. They try to measure, in dollar terms, the net you know, uh, benefit to social welfare from a policy. And there's some assumptions that go into that. One assumption is that $1 to you means the same as $1 to me in terms of our welfare, right? which is an important assumption that may not actually be true. Um, but if we let that one slide, our index is, is not an index of social welfare, but you could add uh, other features to it to make it into an index of social welfare. So the, what we do is we measure the value of freedom to those people who enjoy it. We don't actually consider um, the people who are frustrated by others enjoying freedom. Right? So um, the developers who would like to get other people's property, we don't include the cost to them of them not being able to do that. So you would want to add those in to get a, an index of social welfare, um, which would be something quite different. You could certainly start with the estimates we've made to try to, to come up with such an index. It sounds like you, it'd be best to be moving up this list. So what are some quick short-term and what are some long-term things that you could do to, make, to move yourself up the scale? OK. <clears throat> uh, well, I think the, uh, the proposed tax reform is one good um, short-term move uh, to move up the scale. Um, we do recommend a right to work law, and that's going to be a political battle. There are some, certain things that are less um, ideologically charged, where the state could subtly make inroads. I, I like to look at things like um, you know, relaxing the ability of, um, of alternative health professionals, like nurse practitioners, dental hygienists, physician assistants, allowing them more scope of practice um, to help bring down medical care costs. If you're a poor person, we probably shouldn't be forcing you to go see an MD every time you have a sinus infection. Maybe you could just go to a, a nurse practitioner and, and get your antibiotic. Um, things like uh, reducing occupational licensing. Now you'll run into the buzzsaw of the individual interest group that gets upset by that, whether it's the you know, massage therapist association or whatever. But these are cases where um, you really are locking certain people out of their, their ability to practice a profession and, uh, and make a living. And you know, if you can persuade enough people that, that that's what these laws are about, I think the political case is easy to make. And um, Colorado scores best in our index on occupational licensing. 
And the reason they do is that they happen to have one legislator. They said, you know, let's look at these, all these licensing boards. Let's see whether they're really doing anything helpful to the state. Let's have a sunrise review um, that the, the new licensing boards have to go through before they get implemented. Let's have a sunset review every several years. Uh, let's see whether it's still needed. Um, and as a result, um, you know, Colorado doesn't have the licensing burdens that a lot of other states do. In our research, this is not a highly left-right charged issue. This is not something where, like right to work, where you're going to have this, you know, vehement opposition from one side of the political spectrum. Um, so I think it's an area where reforms could be made pretty quickly and uh, uh, without, um, you know, a political firestorm. One would imagine. Uh, because you're controlling for climate and things like that, and because this is a freedom index, that all of the factors that you chose to compare against states are factors that could be done something about by the government. You could change <coughs> any of those at any time, you know, any legislature. Yeah, that, you never really said that explicitly. I'm just wondering if that was so. Uh, you mean um, all of the things you have control over about making your state higher or lower. Than yeah. Rankings. Well, not climate, obviously, but the other ones. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, yeah. So the the yeah definitely uh, fiscal policy, regulatory policy, personal freedom, even cost of living indirectly. Uh, those are things that that uh, politicians and uh, administrators can change to make their state more attractive. One is on March twenty eighth. Where can we? access the new report. And two, uh, you mentioned that uh, expressed as a percentage of the tax burden, that state and local taxes were in the realm of 40%, federal was 60%, and uh, the implication was that's a large number we should pay attention to state and local as opposed to federal, but it seems to me, under our system of constitution and federalism, that. Ideally, we'd like that number to be much larger, the state and local to be much larger. Do you have an opinion on what a perfect balance would be? Uh, yeah, so the, uh, the, I should mention the URL for the, for the website. It's uh, freedominthe50states.org. Freedominthe50states.org is where uh, you can find the index on the March 28th and be really scared. We have some, some nifty web tools uh, planned, including ability to construct your own freedom index by profit certain variables or categories that you think are not as important. And you can download all the data there, all the spreadsheets. Um, so freedom in the 50 states. Uh, for the second uh, question, I, I agree that a more decentralized system up to uh, a very high point is, is more desirable. Uh, in 1907, I've done some research on this. In 1907, uh, the ratio of state and local tax revenue to total tax revenues in this country was 85%. And the ratio of just local tax revenues to total tax revenues was over 60%. So most of government was local then. It's kind of hard to, hard to believe. Um, I think that's something quite a bit closer to how I would like things to look. Uh, I think we need more diversity among local jurisdictions so people can find the places with the right mix of taxes and services for them. And that's inhibited in a world where the federal government does so much. Jason, thank you for your work. And it's, um, I'm glad to see that someone's actually trying to put a, 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 a gauge on freedom. And it'd be too, it's really too bad that it's not broadcast so the states would compete with each other. I'm trying to get that better. Well, I have basically three questions. I'll try to go through them real quick. One is, you had pie charts. I didn't understand what the percentage numbers meant. Second is, is have you considered um, using like gross um, taxes as a percentage of gross domestic product or union membership numbers as a gauge of freedom? Mm -hmm. And the third is, is how, how does an individual like myself actually sense that we are getting more constrained and more restricted in what we do? Yeah, so the... Uh the pie charts just have the um, each category, it's percentage of the overall index. So liability system is worth 11.5% of the index. 
Remember that discussion I had about um, how do we weight all these individual variables to create this aggregate index? That's what this is. Um, each category's percentage of the weights. Um, so it's sort of an indicator of how important these policies are to the overall index. Um, so something like viability systems is obviously very, very important, especially when you consider how important regulatory policy is to, to growth. Um, taxation is a percentage of GDP. We looked at uh, various ways of measuring tax burden. Uh, we measure tax burden as a percentage of personal income. And the reason we choose personal income rather than GDP is that uh, our research showed that personal income is a better predictor of the size of state government than GDP. Um, the reason is that uh, GDP has um, some, measure some technical measurement issues. I guess I won't get into them, but uh, <laughs> there's some te technical measurement issues that mean that state level GDP figures are not that good. And secondly, um, the sorts of tax bases that states can tax are more associated with personal income. You know, property taxes, income taxes, sales taxes are all pretty correlated with the income that people are actually earning. Good last question. Yeah, the last one is, how do I know that I've got more freedom here in this state than in another state? Oh, oh yeah. As a person, how do I sense that? Just what's on the channel, say the news or something? <laughs> it's, all this is individual, and, that's, uh, and we're trying to help with that, to help you figure out your sense of things. But you might disagree with how we weight these variables, and you might think that certain things are more important for your personal freedom than others, and that's fine. Uh, something like smoking, for instance, you know, I'm not a smoker, my co-op is not a smoker. For us, that's not really that important, but we think that other people's rights should be respected, and. Uh, um, and, and so we don't think that smokers should be uh, Why could you uh, expand upon the definition of the severance taxes where you use the uh, Alaska example? I hadn't heard that term before. And uh, my wife and, well, primarily my wife is homeschooling this year. We've done it before in the past. Um, under the uh, survey where it mentioned the uh, Ohio regulations seemed somewhat unreasonable and it required uh, uh, teacher licensure mandatory uh, uh, state approval. We haven't run into that problem specifically. I don't know if that's just a municipality issue. Yeah, um, so that was, uh, that, yeah, the way that's stated in the, uh, in the, in the last edition is not, uh, not quite correct. Um, so what, uh, what Ohio has is uh, teacher qualifications. So there are certain qualifications that every teacher must have. You don't actually have to get licensed. So that's a, it's a significant difference, um, but still it's a limitation that most other states don't have. And the other thing is um, that um, rather than having to get prior approval for your curriculum, your homeschool curriculum is actually subject to the superintendent's rules. So that's, that's really what we meant to say <laughs> that. But that's, a, that's a good catch with God's comments about that. Can you hear now? Awesome. I'm having a great day with the mic. All right, well, listen, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sorens, for coming. Really appreciate it. Uh, great job. Thank you. So, uh, there's a new organization called the Liberty Foundation that's based in Oklahoma, but that does, this whole goal is to work in all 50 states to try to increase freedom. We released a major report yesterday that I authored called Competitive on Competitive Federalism. Uh, if you've not seen that, please uh, check it out at libertyfound, libertyfound.org. Uh, it's a great new organization that I'm working with to try to really move progressively. We're going to do some stuff next week here in Ohio on Medicaid, uh, the expansion to try to make sure that does not happen, and some other things. So at any rate, uh, thank you for coming. Next event will be in April. Uh, register if you haven't. That's going to be all about competitive federalism, the report that just came out yesterday. We're going to do a big event here uh, uh, on April 23rd, I think is the, the date. So please register for that online like you've done for, for these first two. Uh, again, thank you, Bottom Line CPA, Ohio Rising, Mercatus, thank you very much. And Dr. Soren, appreciate you coming. So have a good day, folks.